A new academic term in Afghanistan has begun. Universities have reopened, but without women being allowed to attend. A move condemned by this special rapporteur with the United Nations. The Taliban's intentional and calculated policy is to repudiate the human rights of women and girls and to erase them from public life. It may am amount uh, to the international crime of gender persecution, for which the authorities can be held accountable. That was Richard Bennett speaking at the Human Rights Council at the UN in Geneva this week. He says the restrictions imposed on women and girls in Afghanistan amount to gender apartheid. And this was the scene in Kabul this week, a group of women protesting for their rights to an education. The Taliban banned them from going to university back in December, just nine months after it barred girls from going to secondary schools. There are also restrictions against women working, traveling long distances, and going to public parks or even gyms. It's all part of the brutal crackdown on women's rights the militant group has imposed since it took back control of the country in 2021. And despite all these restrictions, there are Canadians still helping girls get their education inside Afghanistan. Lauren Oates is one of those Canadians. She's the executive director of Canadian Women for Women in Afghanistan. Lauren, thank you so much for making time for us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Lauren, how are you able to do this? Talk to me about the logistics and the processes. If the law in Afghanistan now says women cannot go to school, cannot get an education, how are you helping them do that? Well, the main thing that the Taliban want is they want girls and women to be at home. They don't want them in public places, at schools, on campuses. So from home, we're giving them an education. And the tool that we use to do that is technology, which is something that wasn't available during the Taliban's first rule back in the 1990s. So we're just trying to take full advantage of that. And the fact that many Afghans are online, they have computers. If they don't, there's ways that we can help them get what they need to get online and so that they can keep learning and get to their classrooms. What kind of response are you seeing? Is it the same amount of girls going to school now that you would see maybe three, four years ago? Oh, not even a fraction of that. It's a tiny fraction of the girls who were enrolled back before the, the change in government. Um, but we hope to scale. We're going as fast as we possibly can without compromising on quality. Um, but uh, we can only reach a certain number. And because of the economic situation in the country, people a lot of families are living in poverty and so they can't afford things you know like a data package to be able to tether their phone online so we're trying to help but we have a very very long wait list a wait list that's longer than the number of students enrolled right now lauren you mentioned poverty and afghanistan finds itself in a situation where families are selling their daughters so that other members of the family can eat and i'm just wondering who are the individuals who are now still able to attend school uh, that, those are absolutely true stories. They're true and tragic stories. They're not urban myths. And there's going to be more and more of them because the economic situation just continues to decline further. Um, the people who can get online, they, they're people from all classes. They're people who had their kids in school prior to the Taliban takeover. And they're also some very, very poor families. We receive correspondence from families who are struggling to put food on the table. Uh, I have um, a, an application from a woman who is a widow. She has one daughter and they are very, very poor, but she wants her daughter in school. That's her number one priority because people recognize that education is the path out of poverty and it's the path to a future. And I think that's more clear now than ever before with the situation in Taliban controlled Afghanistan that education is a ticket out. So people are willing to make huge sacrifices to be able to uh, get to school no matter uh, what the way. And we're trying to to offer these alternative ways for people to go to school. And they are possible now, which I think should be taken advantage of. But Lauren, you mentioned it's the path out of poverty, but it's also the path towards potentially getting arrested, being assaulted by the Taliban, and we know in some extreme cases shot and killed. They're, these girls are breaking the law. Why? Why put themselves in such great risk? That, that's a really important point, and it's something that we had to weigh very, very carefully. Um, there are risks for everyone involved, for students, for teachers, for all the team members on the, the, the project. Um, but there's also a risk to not being educated. 
And I think we're seeing a level of desperation and hopelessness that um, you know drives people to make this choice, education at any cost. So we just try to make sure that people are informed of the risks and they make the choice themselves. And so many times they will choose to take the risk, uh, whatever that is, um, you know, from harassment, detention to worse, um, for being able to get an education because they see that as the most valuable, valuable thing possible. How are you facilitating this? How, how is this getting paid for? Uh, we raise money from Canadians largely, as well as service clubs and foundations, um, supporters who have sometimes been with us for years or sometimes are newly supporting us. Uh, it is relatively inexpensive to run, but at the same time, it is a school. So there's a teacher for every subject. Uh, you know, they go through a full school year. Um, they spend the same amount of time in class as they would in a regular classroom. So they need textbooks and, and all of that. But um, the the, the re relatively modest cost is well, well worth it because this is a long-term investment in a, a future Afghanistan, a peaceful Afghanistan, and it's going to need educated people who can help rebuild down the road, which I hope will be soon. I, I'm trying to visualize it. If groups of young girls and women are walking together into a building, aren't, aren't the police, aren't the security, the Taliban suspicious? Like, how are they making sure they don't get caught? Um, they don't walk to a building. All the education is done from home, which is, uh, you know, makes it not visible and also acceptable to some degree. It's not clear if virtual education is, is illegal, um, but the students are joining, you know, from their, their living rooms, from their homes via tablet, cell phone, computer. So um, that's, that's now the classroom. It's a virtual classroom. Okay. What keeps you going, Lauren? You've been committed to this idea, this issue, this progress in Afghanistan for so long, why? It's a human right. The right to learn is everyone's fundamental right. Um, you know, human rights are just something that they fall apart if they're not for everyone. They're universal or they're nothing. And I just keep thinking, you know, if, if someone told me that I can't go to school because I'm a woman or my daughter can't go to school because she's a girl, I wouldn't accept it for myself. So why on earth should we accept it for anyone else? And I believe so strongly in the outcome of education, which is agency, you know, someone's sense of their own power in the world to determine the path they want to take, the choices they want to take in life. And everyone deserves that. So if we can do something, anything, to make that happen, we should. You know, Rumi has this saying, if all you can do is crawl, crawl. So we try to focus more on the possibilities rather than the barriers um, and get creative and, and do something. And I think it, it, will, it will make an impact down the road. And even if one girl gets to go to school who otherwise couldn't, you know, that's someone's life transformed, but we're reaching hundreds more. So it is, it is something we can do despite the crisis that's underway in Afghanistan right now. Before I let you go, Lauren, I do have to ask you, because while the focus of this conversation is on Afghanistan, in recent days we've been reporting on hundreds of girls in Iran getting allegedly poisoned because they're attending school. When you hear those stories, how do you react? I think that this shows so clearly that attacks on education are intentional by design. They are not accidental and that fundamentalist forces know the power of education. They are very, very threatened by educated girls and women. And, and so they seek to, to undermine that in a very systemic way. Um, and, and you know we in the West have to recognize that and in turn have to recognize the power of education to, to defeat uh, fundamentalist ideologies. Um, so I, I think this is one and the same cause, one and the same battle. And, and I, I salute the courage of the women in Iran and the women in Afghanistan, uh, who, in fact, just this week of uh, International Women's Day came together and are calling for uh, the term gender apartheid to, to be a, a, a legal concept that can be used to sanction regimes and actors that um, systematically deny the, the right to education and the other human rights of women and girls. So I really hope that th those efforts um, uh, come to fruition and the international community takes these activists and what they're calling for seriously. Lauren Oates, thank you so much for your time. My pleasure. Thank you.